Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 103 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is John Crawley. John grew up in the United States in an Irish immigrant family, and after returning to Ireland for several years, he became committed to the cause of Irish independence, vowing to return to join the IRA one day. After a stint in the USMC as a recon Marine, he brought his combat training back with the intent to fight back against British occupying forces in Northern Ireland. John spent years in an active service unit before coming back to the U.S. again to purchase arms and ammunition for the cause. Upon his return to Ireland, he and his shipmates were betrayed by an informant and arrested, and he spent 10 years in prison. I invited John onto the podcast to discuss his life and struggles with the Irish Republican Army, which he wrote about in his book, The Yank, published late last year. After you finish listening to this episode, you can download a free sample of his book to check it out for yourself. Just click the link in the show notes to read the prologue and chapter one. But before we dive into John's story, I want to tell you all about my favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I've found that Novichok stays with me all day long, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash, six different mini bottles at one great price, which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out, either via a link in the show notes of this episode, at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com, or on Instagram, at clandestinelaboratories. John, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've only discussed Northern Ireland once before here on the podcast, so I'm very happy to get the chance to talk to you about it and to shed a lot more light on this subject because it's one that my listeners find very interesting. Mm -hmm. Sure. I wanted to ask you, I, I know that the events that we're talking about happened, you know, 40, 30, 20 years ago, quite a while back. What was it that led you to finally write this book and just publish it last year? Well, a lot of it was I was sort of living what Thoreau called a, a life of quiet desperation. I was listening to a narrative being spun that the struggle for Irish freedom you know, was simply about ending partition. And for most of Ireland's history, Ireland wasn't partitioned. And you know, the struggle for Irish freedom was, was, was always about breaking the connection with England and forging a national democracy within an all-Ireland republic. Under the Good Friday Agreement, it's a two nations agreement in which the one nation republic we fought for is being diluted to a two nations Ireland, that if Ireland is united, it won't be united in the civic sense. It might be united territorially, but the whole point of republicanism was to unite Irishmen across the sectarian divide you know, under the common name of citizen, of Irish citizen. So I, I wrote the book largely with that in mind. Myself and many other Republicans were frustrated by the political direction things had taken since the Good Friday Agreement. It's called the peace process. I'm for the peace. I, I'm not against the peace. Well, I would consider it to be more pacification. But my criticism is, is of the process because the process is not designed to lead towards our goal of a united Irish Republic. Hmm. I, I don't know, you know, how up to speed maybe your readers would be with the nuances of this. You know, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into a political lecture or anything like that. But I mean, if you'd like me to explain anything more on that, I will, Justin. I hope I'm, I hope I'm explaining that. Yeah, okay. I, I think that we're going to cover it as we go through, certainly. And I'll admit that, you know, I was not especially familiar with the 
tremendous complexities there. And there's, even though I've read two books on the subject recently, including yours, that in, in no way is a, is, gives me a complete understanding of the hundreds of years of history and all the personalities and all the, the hidden things that went on as well, all the different factions and perspectives and that sort of thing. But, you know, absolutely. nevertheless, I'm, I'll absolutely dive at any opportunity to learn more about that because it is such an interesting and important period and location as well. So sure. I, I want to kind of go back all the way to the beginning of your story, of course, as a very young man, I guess I would say as a teenager, really, you grew up in the United States, but eventually went back to Ireland. Is that right? Was that, I guess that was incredibly formative for you then that trip back? I left Chicago. My father was an Irish immigrant and so was my mother. He had been a builder over there and he wanted to come home to Ireland and he asked me, would, would I be okay with it? So I came over for a summer around 1971 when I was about, I think, 13. I loved it. I just loved every bit of Ireland. I loved everything about it. I moved over the following year on my own and stayed with an aunt in a rural part of County Roscommon. So I had left like this American, you know, split level house in suburban Chicago and ended up on a farmhouse with no central heating, you know, had to go to the well for water, had to milk cows in the morning. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved it. and loved everything about Ireland. And after about a year, my parents came back over and we moved to Dublin. So I went to school in Ireland for a couple of years. They were formative years. You know, they were my teenage years, you know, in transition from boy to man. They were quite formative. I didn't have a Republican background, really. I wasn't, I didn't know anybody who was really pro-IRA, so to speak. I formed my own opinions from my own reading, my own. I was always interested in history, always interested in, in nonfiction and biographies and read voraciously, formed an opinion that Ireland should be a fully independent and united country. And decided that at some stage, you know, I should walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So I followed the path that I followed. Hmm. So this this was very much like a, a gradual move for you. It wasn't like you you witnessed some terrible event or something like that that kind of you know radicalized you as as we might put it these days. It was just kind of a gradual reading yeah. and, and growing perception. It was. It was. There was certainly no epiphany. It was a gradual dawning and realization. But it's important to realize that I grew up in the United States. I grew up in a republic, a republic and a democracy that had, had fought Britain, you know, to achieve its own freedom. So that was formative. And I mean, you know, every morning we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. There was words in the Pledge of Allegiance that resonated with me my entire life, you know, like the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I believe Ireland should have the same. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very understandable sentiment, especially when you are, you know, you grew up in the United States where we obviously celebrate our independence from British rule and our country has, you know, only increased its stature and standing in the world and quality of living from that time up through the 1970s. So you've got a wonderful example to look to then, and then you go back home. And I understand that obviously not just the history of Ireland, but your family also had a history, some, some distant familial ties anyway to the kind of struggle against British rule. Is that correct? Well, a typical Irish family, uh, on my father's side, my, my father's uncle, I, and I met him shortly before he died in 1872. He had been a senior IRA leader in County Roscommon during what they call the Tan War or the, or the, the War of Independence in the South. And he, he, he played quite a prominent role and was very active. But his brother had joined the British Army and was actually killed with the so-called Irish Guards in Flanders in October 1916, fighting hmm. in the British Army. So, you know, and a lot of Irish families had... He, now, he wouldn't have been pro-British in the sense that he supported British rule. It was, it was a complicated thing. At the time, there was a constitutional Irish parties were saying, if you fight for the Brits, you know, they will eventually give Ireland a devolved assembly called Home Rule that'll still be part of the empire, but, you know, you'll have local autonomy. So a lot of Irishmen were lured to their deaths and joined the British Army and, you know, were, were killed for what James Connolly, one of the Irish leaders from 1916, called the, the, the deferred promise of a shadow of liberty. But my uncle Tom, my granduncle Tom Crawley, he took a more direct route and joined the IRA. He was quite active. But I have to say, I met him and I was impressed with the story, but it didn't influence me to join the IRA or anything like that. I mean, I have countless cousins and relatives who met Tom and heard the story and they didn't join the IRA. So, you know, I was impressed with it, but it, it, it certainly didn't, it didn't compel me to become a Republican. Hmm. Okay. So I know that you were there in your, your teen years, obviously, but you didn't immediately 
joined the IRA, you came back to the United States, in fact. So can you talk about your, your reasoning and then what happened after you returned to the U.S.? Well, I would have joined the IRA at 18, but I didn't know anybody in it. They don't. I was <laughs> living in Dublin. And they, don't, they don't call the IRA a secret army for nothing. <laughs> so I decided what I would do is I'd go back and I'd join the United States military and I would get training. And I had, I had two reasons for this. One was to enhance my own professional development. Now, I had heard countless times from the Brits and other people that the IRA was this highly trained, highly professional guerrilla force. So I didn't form the opinion or I wasn't presumptuous enough that I was going to go over and learn these skills and come back and, and, you know, make the IRA better. That was never, that never crossed my mind. It was really to enhance my own professional development and also to test my commitment because I knew that if I went away to the States for four years and joined the military, and if I came back and I still joined the IRA, then I knew I was committed to it. So it was a bit of a test for myself, a test in many ways. I joined the U.S. Marines in May 1975. I got out of the U.S. Marines. I was discharged on the 29th of May, 1979 at 8 o'clock in the morning. And at 2 o'clock that afternoon, I was on a connecting flight to catch a plane back to Ireland. Wow. Wow. So I'm I'm sure that you went through tremendous personal development during those four years, but your allegiance, I guess you could say, never wavered in the slightest and your commitment never wavered in the slightest during that time period, huh? No, I took an oath to support and defend the American Constitution. And although I would have great issues, like many people do, with you know aspects of American foreign policy, I, I, I do think the United States has a, has a fantastic constitution and a fantastic democracy, and I would be very supportive of that. I had no no problem loyalty wise joining the U.S. Marines, but I still had this pull, this emotional pull, this deep draw to return to Ireland and fight for the full freedom and independence of Ireland. And I, like I say in the book, you know, I. I did my bit for the American Republic and the Marines, and then I returned to join the IRA and do my bit for the Irish Republic. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like your service, for the way that you described it in the book was very, very formative. And of course, it was honorable, that sort of thing. There weren't any issues or anything. Yeah. Did you, no, no. were you able to express at all to anyone while you were in that you were planning to return to Ireland right after that? Were you able to, you know, kind of talk openly about your, you know, your, your ties to your home country, or did you kind of keep all of that under your hat? No, no. Well, I mean, people would have known that, you know, Ireland was my home address and my parents lived there. And, you know, my next to kin would have all been Ireland, you know, on my on my records. I didn't talk openly about, you know, wanting to join the IRA or anything like that. Sometimes people would joke about it. Like, you know, I, I, a number of times people said to me, oh, you're probably over here. You're going to go back and join the IRA. And you're like, like a joke type of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that happened quite a few times, actually, especially around <laughs> St. Patrick's Day. And I just shrug it off and say, but I mean, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't say for sure, you know, whether, you know, when I got home, would I have the guts to see it through? And also I didn't even know, I, did, I didn't know if the IRA would accept me or not. So there was all, all that was in the mix as well. But no, there were 400 years, the Marines. I, I learned a lot. The Mar U.S. United States Marines are an extremely professional organization. I was in a recon unit. I became a, a recon instructor. You know, I did parachute training, scuba training, submarine training, lock in, lock out from famous reconnaissance, things like that. So it was... It was a qu quite comprehensive training. I enjoyed it very much. I had some excellent opportunities too. I mean, at one stage, they, they told me that I had a very high language aptitude on my entrance exams, and they tried to get me to learn Chinese, and then they asked me what I learned Russian. But I, you know, I couldn't tell them. Well, I, I, I plan to go home and join the IRA. So, <laughs> you know, those were those were career moves. One thing they offered me too. One day when I was in advanced infantry training, I was called out to an administration block. Had no idea why met a young naval officer there, and he asked me would I go to attend the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And that was a massive opportunity because you don't need to tell anybody in the United States about Annapolis. And, you know, you usually need a recommendation of a state senator or congressman to go there. And it was the opportunity of a lifetime, really. But, you know, they were going to take me out of advanced infantry training if I said yes. They were going to put me in a nine-month prep school, then four years in the academy. After four years in the academy, I could choose after two years. Sorry, after two years in the academy, I could decide whether to become an officer in the Marines or the Navy. And then I had to give six years guaranteed service. So basically 10 or 11 years, I had to make a decision right there and then. Now, you know, had I decided to make it a career, I think I would have jumped at that chance. But I, I was quite determined to return home to Ireland. So I didn't accept it. But, you know, looking back on it, it was, it, it, you know, you, you talk about the forks in the road in your life and you often wonder if you took this direction or that direction, what way things would have panned out, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was, I'm sure that you could very clearly see the two different forks, maybe not the details, of course, but I mean, it, it sounds like you, yeah. I mean, well, I, I should say, how much did you hesitate? Did you think, wow, maybe I really should give up on this, you know, this dream of joining an organization that I don't even know anybody in or, 
you know, did you yeah. seriously consider it or were you like, no, 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 Ireland is my home. That's where I'm returning. Well, no, it crossed my mind. I'll be honest with you. It did cross my mind. I mean, it was a tremendous opportunity, but I, I decided to, you know, maintain my conviction to return to Ireland. And I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, live in Ireland anyway. I declined, but it's just one of these, just one of these things I often wonder, like, had I been in a different mood on a different day, you never know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Did you have to give any kind of a story? I shouldn't say have to. Did you choose to give any kind of a story like, you know, to your friends as you're getting close to your separation date? I'm sure they were asking you, okay, what are you going to do when you get out? Did you say I'm going back to Ireland and my family or did you say, oh, I'm going to, you know, look for a job in Chicago or something like that? Oh, no. I, I, oh, no. They all knew I was going back to Ireland to my family. I just more or less said, well, my dad was a builder over there and I was going to get work with him. You know, okay. and that was it. And in fact, a bunch of my a bunch of my buddies at the reconnaissance school, Little Virginia, they they saw me off at the airport. You know, when I left the day I got out, and you know, and they knew I was gonna get a flight back to Ireland. You know, I made, I made no secret of that. Hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah, I don't think that. Well, no, I shouldn't say I don't think that's speculation on my part. So, do you yeah. think that anyone in in that era, in that time frame, were people looking at the IRA here in the United States? Were they looking at the IRA as as the bad guys, so to speak, or was there, you know, was it people saying, "Okay, well, we fought for our freedom from the Brits, and and so are they"? Or what do you think was the perception well, well, of the IRA at that time? Well, it varied. I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of Irish and Irish Americans would, would have seen them as, as a genuine, legitimate resistance organization. And of course, others would have seen them as terrorists and that they were fighting the British who were, you know, number one ally of the United States, you know, but allies come and go. I mean, Britain tried to destroy the United States in the cradle during the <laughs> revolution. They tried to fight them in 1812. They did it again. And in, during the American um, Civil War, if it wasn't for the Union victory in Antietam, it's highly likely England would have recognized Confederacy and split the United States that way because the, the British have a real long policy of divide and rule. And But I mean, the, the fact of the matter is for the last century and a half or more, Britain has been you know, a major ally of the United States, still is. So there's that factor. So I, some would see me as fighting an ally of the United States, but I would have just seen it as you know fighting somebody occupying Ireland. I would look at it as a definitely as a as legitimate a legitimate oh, cause and a legitimate struggle but you know yes, one man. man's you know fighters another man's terrorist and that's that's the reality of it you know yeah absolutely i mean people will make very articulate arguments on both sides but you know you lived it and that's absolutely. why we're here to hear from you today absolutely. of course sure, so of course i mean uh, there's uh, all kinds of perspectives on this Definitely. Definitely. So John, you, like you said, you were on a plane the same day you got out of the Marine Corps. So what happened actually once you touched back down in Ireland? Well, unlike the U S Marines, the IRA didn't have recruiting offices. They're a legal organization. Being a member is a automatic jail sentence. So I had to figure out a way how to join. It took me about eight or nine months, but I eventually found out that a fellow who had been in the IRA had been in prison. He'd actually left the IRA, but I, I got a job on a building project with him and I approached him and I think he rapidly guessed my intentions by my line of questioning. He tried to discourage me actually. And one thing I have to say in fairness about the IRA is they don't sex it up. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't try to recruit you like, like a conventional military with all these promises and that to tell you straight out, if you join the IRA, you're going to, you're going to end up dead or in jail. I mean, they tell you that straight out, unless we win in the meantime. He tried to talk me out of it, but I was determined. So eventually he kind of washed his hands of it and he got somebody who knew there was an IRA to approach me. And he just let it, he, you know, he didn't want to be responsible for me or anything like that. He let this guy approach me and we took it from there. I talked to this guy, it took a couple of months. I went to some lectures, things like that. And they checked out my background and I didn't know if they let me in. And as, as I said, also, you know, I joined with a sense, you know, with a sense of purpose, but I was concerned they might think I was just somebody who was looking for a sense of purpose, like almost an adventurer, you know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. You have to be wary of people like that too, who join organizations. But no, I, I am deeply committed Republican and deeply committed to the to the struggle for full Irish freedom, and I think I think they rapidly deduced that. I was eventually sworn into the IRA. Hmm. Amazing. Was was there ever like something close to a formal interview process or was it just a series of conversations where they kind of tried to feel you out a little bit? I mean, did they, you know, have you write down the name of all of your relatives or anything like that prior to the swearing in? Well, one thing in the area, you never write anything down. 
Hmm. It was uh, informal conversations, and then there was a formal. The, the IRA have what they call the Green Book. It's sort of like the Constitution, and you have to read that. And it's the Constitution of what the IRA is about and, and their objectives and stuff. But it, but you know the reality of it is, you can boil it down to one sentence: If you inform, you'll be shot. That's the main <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? That's really what it's all about. You know, you give your loyalty to the struggle. I remember, you know, there used to be this this narrative or this misconception that, you know, one sin never out. That's nonsense. I mean, you could leave the IRA at any time, but hmm. while you're in it, you 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 have to be loyal to the organization and not talk out of school. Yeah, I can imagine. I know that they certainly in, enforce that from everything that I've read in the past. Yeah. So, well, a small group organization, your greatest threat is the informer. I mean, it's it's just certainly. it's it's and the IRA was infiltrated sometimes at a very high level. So it's, it's, you know, and the British are very, very good at it. They're, they really, they really good at it. I mean, they built, they built an empire and they kind of know what they're doing in the counterinsurgency field. I, I, I do, I do respect their, their abilities at that. They're very good. Hmm. Actually. Yeah. That brings up a good point and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but you certainly alluded sure. to that high level infiltration that you just mentioned, but you, you kind of, I don't know if I'd say talk around it a little bit, but you don't really make any direct I guess, accusations or anything like that in the book. But I guess you had very, very serious concerns about some people who were very high within the organization, I take it. I certainly did. But, you know, a lot of the evidence is circumstantial. And there's other evidence that's a bit more solid. But for me to expound on that would betray confidences that I'm not prepared mm. to do. Mm. But the IRA is very was a very compartmentalized organization. And the thing about it is, over the years, since the ceasefires and that, people have been able to talk more. People like myself are starting to connect dots that we weren't able to connect before. Hmm. And in some cases, it, it's painting a, a very disturbing picture about the level of infiltration. Yeah. So can we expect even now, so many years later, we can expect some new revelations in, in the coming years, you think, one way or the other? Well, I hope so, because I would like the truth to come out. But mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to know because the British had informers during the 1798 rebellion, which they still haven't publicly said who they were. <laughs> you believe it or not, apparently somebody was studying records in, in London and came across two informers during the 1916 Rising, codenamed Chalk and Granite. Apparently they were high level and the Brits to this day won't say who they were. Hmm. Whether in, in my lifetime we'll hear any of this, I have my doubts, but you know, I would like to. I mean, oh, we, yeah. a lot of us would like to know what was going on, you know. I'm sure. And why I'm some sure. decisions were made that time made no sense. Yeah, I would like to know that as well. And I do know just from speaking with some British authors and historians in the past on, on a variety of subjects, that Official Secrets Act over there, I mean, uh -huh. they just never declassify anything practically. No. So it's very tough no. to get any true official information, true documents out of anywhere. It's really tough. The Official Secrets Act, official Secrets Act really shuts things down. Yes. And the secret state in Britain is, 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 is well, well embedded and very powerful and almost all encompassing. So, you know, yeah. uh, if anything comes out, it'll be because it suits them for it to come out and not till then, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when that will happen or if I can't hold my breath, though, much as I would like to, because, you know, I, I really love Absolutely. finding out, you know, the truth behind all this. But I've been frustrated uh, so, so many <laughs> times and have so many other historians. Yeah. So, sure. John, back sure. to you then. So sure. you joined and you, you had a you know, very significant amount of recent, you know, firearms and tactical training and experience and that sort of thing. And how applicable was that once you actually joined the IRA in their particular breed of conflict? Well, I found almost none of it was. The IRA was a very ad hoc organization. It, it, was, it was a civilian organization led by civilians. You know, they had done some good operations in the past. And, you know, I had been hearing from the Brits that they were this highly trained most highly trained organization, grill organization practically in the world. But I believe now the Brits were saying that because it wasn't, and they wanted to keep the people who were who were keeping it that way in charge. Hmm. Because I, I mean, I, I remember making suggestions for qualitative changes that would have improved our operational effectiveness. And many times would be told, sure, what are you on about? Sure, even the Brits say we're the best trained grillers in the world, you know. Wow. You know, I was very impressed with the caliber of people. There were some very brave people. You had to make tremendous sacrifices. It was a life of hardship, sacrifice, and poverty. It was an extremely dangerous life. If you were active, you were, you were going to end up dead or in jail almost certainly. To answer your question, Justin, I found from the men on the ground, the actual active service volunteer on the ground was very, very keen to learn. Very keen. But I would find blockages at the top. 
I found a lack of respect for training. I came from an organization like from like from the U.S. Marines, and I had been I had been a trainer, I had been an instructor, where training was so highly developed and so highly priced. I mean, it was a bit like the Spartans, where they used to say, "War is something you do in between training," you know. But there was a lack of lack of respect of training at a high level. I actually two members of the IRA Army Council on separate occasions telling me you could train a monkey to shoot. And I remember hmm. saying, well, you know, you can maybe teach a monkey to point and pull, but you can't teach a monkey sight picture, sight alignment, trick and control. And you can't teach monkeys how to move, shoot, and communicate as part of a cohesive team. So that shocked me. That, that was a major culture shock for me. And sometimes I found I was being gaslighted. You know, and they'd be saying things like, oh, well, sure, you're coming from the Marines, and that's a conventional force, and we're guerrillas, and that doesn't apply to us. And, and you know, I used to be thinking, you know, well, ballistics are ballistics. It doesn't matter, you know, where you are. But I got a tremendous reception from men on the ground, and, and, and there was a real hunger and thirst for knowledge. I found that in the field of – the IRA was good at explosives, and they had a good engineering department. But in the field of small arms and tactics, I found the training was quite abysmal, to be honest. Hmm. abysmal and in fact a lot of the training was quite quite wrong because they were given misinformation like one of the things i mentioned in the book and i heard this countless times that the british army infantry helmet was impervious to high velocity rifle fire which it wasn't and countless times that would have affected how men you doing an operation if they thought well the helmets are bulletproof and the jackets are bulletproof so you know there's no point you know shooting at them really you know my gosh it had an attritional effect on our operational effect there's no question now there's real important. Like, I don't want to come across that the men were stupid or dummies. They certainly were not. They absolutely were not. And there were some very intelligent people there, but very few of them had any professional military training. And the thing about it is the IRA had a lot of people who had professional military training. I mean, a lot of people in the IRA, believe it or not, had been in the British Army. A lot had been in the Irish Army. And, you know, I met guys who'd been in the French Foreign Legion and, in the, and you know, and, and different in the American Army. So that pool of knowledge was there, but we never seemed to have a leadership that did a skills audit and to put that together to improve our abilities. And I I found that hard to understand at the start, although looking back at it now, I think I understand better why that was. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So that, that was very shocking for me to read that they didn't consider training to be particularly important or standardization or, or anything like that. So if they didn't see those things as important, what did they think was going to allow them to kind of carry the, the fight in the end, if not, you know, well-trained people, you know, acting in a cooperative kind of teamwork manner? Like, wh- how did they you think that, that they just, were going to overcome? You know, Justin, that's an excellent question. And I've been asking myself that for years. I really don't know. They talked about attrition. I remember hearing about attrition, but, you know, attrition isn't a strategy. I mean, if you're fighting a war of attrition, I don't think you have a strategy. You know, I never felt we were fighting with the tempo that we would have an attritional strategy against British forces that would, that would ever make any difference to Britain anyway. Like I said, they were pretty good at, at engineering, at making, you know, homemade improvised devices, things like that. But as far as basic infantry combat was concerned, it was very bad. Now, there were exceptions like in South Oman, places like that. But in those cases, it was individual, on-the-ground leadership. It was talent. It was some people came along of inspirational significance who just had the talent, the ability, and the leadership to move things on in the direction that, you know, a Republican wanted to see it go. And South Amal was a particularly good area in that. But there were other areas where the IRA were that were very poor, Hmm. very poor. I never saw any overarching organizational attempt to address that. Yeah, that is that is really something that was very, very eye opening for me to read, certainly. And we have since you brought up South Armagh, that was the subject of the previous episode, our discussion of the troubles. And it was fascinating. Oh, yes. And you held those guys in very high regard, from what I understand. Very high esteem, very high regard for guys who had no professional training themselves. They were smart. They were courageous. They were extremely tight in the sense that they their security was tight as a drum. I mean, Definitely for the vast bulk of their operational history, they had no informers. I think people would be shocked if they knew how few people were actually conducting operations south of Ma. It was literally, you could put them in the back of a van. Oh, you know my what gosh. I mean? yeah. A handful of people. Now, there was a wide support base, people who give information, people who would keep men, people who would allow maybe sheds to be used to mix explosives, things like that. But the actual operators on the ground, it was just a handful. You know, I don't want to come across as hard or bloodthirsty. There was a war on. Killing is not a good thing. 
But from a purely military point of view, one in six British soldiers killed during the Troubles in, 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 the, in the north of Ireland were killed within three miles of the small village square in Cross Maglen in South Armagh. So their operational ability in Tempo was, was, was the best. The Brits put through everything they had at it. Everything could never break them. And it's the only place where we habitually held initiative and had the British on the back foot. Hmm. Everywhere else, the British were, I think, in command of the strategic landscape, right across the board, really. But in South Armagh, they were definitely on the back foot. And again, it was down to a handful of very courageous patriots. Hmm. That's really my hat's that. off to them. My hat's off to them. Yeah, definitely. I admired those guys so much. Yeah, quite a story. It was very eye-opening for me. And for the listeners, anyone who has not heard that episode yet, we discussed it in depth, the the fight in South Armagh in episode 89 with Toby Harnden, if you want to go back and listen to that one after this. But yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's really Toby Harnden. I, I don't know, but I read, I read his book. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silence lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. Yes, yes. And he told me actually that he's read your book as well recently. Oh, did he? Yes. (laughs) He just told me last night via email. Okay, okay. Okay. So, is it a, a, a very interesting book, Bandit Country, I believe. It was. Yes, yes, Bandit Country, very, very good read. It's out of print right now, it's, unfortunately. So, I, I had a he sent me a, a digital copy of it, but it's not for sale anywhere at the moment, other than like real oh. rare book dealers. But should be back in print because it, yeah, it, it portrays those guys as extremely creative, extremely cunning, extremely capable in all ways. Honestly, and you're right, they they took everything that the British military could throw at them, and they took it in stride. You know, a bunch, a bunch of civilians, untrained guys to, to be able to do what they did. But what frustrated me was I believe if we could have got one more area in the north of Ireland at the, to, to their level of operational tempo and ability, I think it would have been a very different story mm-hmm. in the end. You know, I think we'd have had a much stronger negotiating position. See, these things, Justin, then they always end in negotiations. That was always going to happen. But it, it's how strong your negotiating position is when you go to the table. That's really crucial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And that is how the story ends finally. So I guess we can talk sure. about that a little bit towards the end there. Sure. So I, I want to ask you, John, so you were a volunteer in an active service unit. Can you just talk about kind of like the day-to-day and the type of missions that you went on and what was expected of you, that sort of thing? Well, because there's no amnesty here, I can't really talk about missions. I, I, ah, okay. I mentioned sure. two operations in the book. One, the enemy didn't show up, but I was able to give a, a, a description of how you set the thing up and you know some of the other factors around it. There, there was another operation I mentioned that the Brits never claimed happened. Uh, it, it sounds a bit Walter Mitty, but somebody would have to read the book to, to really kind of, I'm sorry, but I have to be a little bit coy here because <laughs> if I push the boat out too far, I'm technically still on parole actually. Mm. So I have to be careful. But to answer your question, day to day, even though I wasn't on the run, I lived like I was because I was, I, I gave full-time commitment. So I didn't want to be seen in, in you know, in, in, in Republican areas and Republican pubs. So I lived with people who were on the run for the most part. It was a really tough, hard life. You could spend days or maybe two weeks at a time on some guy's farm, helping them milk cows. You had to do something to give back, you know, because they were feeding you and keeping you. You might be cleaning out a shed. You might be, you know, more or less doing farm labor for two weeks. And then an operation might come up and you go off for a couple of days and do that. 
it was sort of like the American military or any military. A lot of it is hurry up and wait, hurry up, oh, hurry yeah. up, and then you spend a lot of time waiting, you know. I can't be too specific except on operations I was actually arrested on and was on trial for, Justin. So I am curious, since you said you were working on farms and that sort of thing, does the, yeah. if you can tell us anyway, did you receive any kind of a salary as a as a service member with the IRA? I mean, no. how, how did you kind of make no. your way in life when you're a, vol- a volunteer? Um, we, we totally depended on people to keep us and feed us. I never had money. I mean, it was just, it, it, so what, what would happen was at the time in the early eighties, you were supposed, if you were a full-time volunteer, like I was, you were supposed to get 10 pound a week, you know, which was derisory sum. And that was for your toothpaste. You know, if you smoked, you know, for your toiletries, things like that. But I, I very rarely got that. And I mean, especially after the hunger strikes, I, I never even wanted to look for it or ask for it because men died in hunger strike. I, I felt guilty even looking for 10 pound, you know what I mm. mean? It's kind of hard to believe, but totally penniless. Money was always a problem, always a problem for the IRA and in, in, in everything they did. A lot of guys went to jail, to be honest with you, for robbing banks and things like that. There were absolutely no salary in the IRA. If you were a full-time operator in the early 80s, you got, at that time, £10 a week. I don't oh know, gosh. maybe $20 a week for your toiletries, if you got it. And you, I usually didn't even get that. Hmm. I didn't smoke or drink anyway. Do you think that that led to, I mean, obviously it was a very dangerous job, but did that, you know, austere lifestyle, did that lead to a lot of attrition as well? Were there people coming in and out very briefly and realizing it was not for them in your experience? Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, it did. Yeah. You don't want anybody there who doesn't want to be there because that is a major weak link. Oh, sure. So, you know, I used to hear, oh, don't join the IRA because if, once you're in, you're never out. I don't know where that came from, but no, you could leave at any time. And a lot of people did. It's a tough life. So yes, people would, you know, and then people go to jail and they'd come out of jail and they'd leave then. And then other people like myself and like many others would end up back in jail a second or a third time, you know, mm-hmm. it was just personal level commitment. I have to say I was lucky in one sense. I was a young man. I was very physically fit. I wasn't married. I had no ties or connections. Had I been married, had I had kids, it would have been a different story. There were married men there. And I remember, especially in jail and that, I felt really sorry for married men with small kids at Christmas, oh, that. things like that. I mean, th- th- thank God I, I, I didn't have family then or anything, you know. Hmm. At least I didn't have that cross to carry, as they say, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So since yeah. you mentioned you were staying with families often and working until a mission came down, how did yeah. missions come down? Was it like a courier network or coded telephone calls or, or anything like that exactly? Like as compartmentalized no, it, as you it, it, was, it was It was surprisingly initiative driven and ad hoc. You, you, you'd come up with something. I mean, something could happen like you could be on a farm and somebody might come and say, the, the Brits have set up a checkpoint at such and such a crossroads and they've been there two days in a row and they'll probably be there tomorrow. They'd alter their, their patterns. Or a particular target could have been seen somewhere, or it was very, very ad hoc. It wasn't a case of where you had like an operations officer working with an intelligence officer, like in a conventional military, getting information, planning the operation, and then delegating the operation to men on the ground. That that really didn't happen. Things happen really from the initiative of the people on the ground. In South Amar, for example, they'd be there and they, you know, they'd see British soldiers at a particular point and they would engage with them. Nobody would give them the orders to do it. Yeah, I suppose that, that, that's a bit surprising, come, you know, having come from a conventional military to be in a situation where, you know, you basically you want to get something done. You just go and do it. Wow. That was really it. Amazing. Obviously, sometimes you did have to have some intelligence. I mean, I wasn't from the North, so I didn't know what was going on. People would have to give you information. Mm -hmm. It was very, very initiative driven organization. Okay. Things got done if you did it. And that was it. Wow. Wow. I I can certainly imagine that there were major drawbacks for that, but I'm just also imagining the intelligence analysts in the British army who are kind of, you know, supposed to be putting together like their, their link charts of all the people in the IRA, how impossible that must've been. If you guys were just thinking up stuff on your own out there scattered to the four winds and doing it without any kind of electronic communications to track or courier networks to, you know, burn or anything like that. That must've been so much more difficult for them to kind of put together a picture of who was who. Well, well, it would have been, but, but, but you see what happened then around 1986 and I was in, I was in jail at the time, but the IRA had a thing called Northern command and an order came out that active service units had to clear operations through Northern command. Hmm. Now, the reason being, there was two reasons given. One was so that adjacent units wouldn't, if you were in one area and a unit carried out an operation in another area, there could be a major response and you could drive into that because you didn't know that unit was going to carry out an operation. Sure. And, and the other reason was, to, was was so that they could clear operations to lessen 
the danger to civilians or unintended targets or unintended consequences. However, a lot of people believe that that was a ploy by British, by British intelligence, that they got people in there. Because you see, you had the system, like you said, Justin, it was active service units, they weren't tied in, and you had really good security. Now you're going to do an operation, or let's say a fairly major operation, now you're going to run it by Northern Command. Now, if the Brits have an agent in Northern Command, which myself and many poli- people believe they did, now the Brits got wind of the operation before mm-hmm. it even happens. And then, I don't want to go off down too many rabbit holes here, but if you heard of the British agent in the area called Steak Knight Scapatici. Yes, yes, I have read a little bit about him. Yeah. Well, he was the head of IRA intelligence and security, and he was working for the British for years. And the thing about it is, if an operation would go wrong, say a volunteer was killed or, or something would go wrong, the, the IRA would have an investigation. Why did it go wrong? They would send Scapatici down. Now, Scapatici was a British agent. So right away, the Brits knew everything about their operation. Who was on the operation? Everything. While on the face of it, we should have been extremely tight, from 86 on, steps were taken to centralize decision-making, which actually ended up dest- nearly destroying us in the end. And an interesting thing is, South Amal would not let anybody know about their operations. Because they were so, so effective, because they were so important to the IRA, they were ab- actually able to tell the IRA, basically, on your bike, you're, you're, we're not telling hmm. you nothing. You know what I mean? Amazing. Nobody else could get away with that, really. Mm-hmm. But South Amal was able to, Incredible. to a large extent. Yeah. My gosh. So, really like like you said, Justin, we, we had a good setup there. The Brits got in. I believe the Brits, over a long period of time, were able to destroy that. Oh, man. It sounds like them. All right. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, any, well, in fairness, any intelligence agency would do that. But, I yeah. mean, that's their job. Right. Like, why wouldn't you know, they try to do uh, all of that? Yeah, no, if we had any sense, we would have fought harder against that happening. Because I think it led to the deaths of a lot of volunteers mm. and the capture of a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly possible. I mean, they were doing their jobs and you were doing yours, certainly, and a lot of lessons it. learned on both sides, Absolutely. lessons learned the hard way. The hard way, that's, that, that, that is how you learn. Yeah, certainly is. So I know we, we've kind of referred to it a little bit, but I know that you eventually were sent back to the United States on a, on a, out of your active service unit and on a very different type of mission. Can you, so can you talk about what happened there exactly? One day, Martin McGinnis called me, asked me to go see him, and he told me he wanted me to go to the States to get weapons and uh, to set up a weapons network. He told me straight out, he was sending me because I had an American accent. And my American accent, I think would have been much stronger back then. Well, it would have been actually 40 Mm -hmm. years ago. I thought it was ridiculous because I'd been in a Marine recon instructor. You know, I had a lot of knowledge resources that I I thought I, I could give to the IRA or help the IRA with. And I thought that I had a lot more to contribute than my accent. But, you know, I, I remember himself and other leadership figures never once referring to my Marine training, never once referring to anything like that. The way they were sending me it was simply because I had an American accent. I couldn't understand it because we only needed to get four or five different types of weapons, AR-15s, HK-91s, things like that. I mean, you know, anybody could have done it. And we had lots of people in America with American accents who were supporters could have done it. But for some reason, no, I was sent over. I had to go. So, you know, they were orders. So... I was given a, a $5 note cut in erratic manner. I had to meet somebody in Boston who had the other half of this note. They introduced me to Whitey Bulger. Now, it's everybody called him Jim Bulger. You didn't call him Whitey to his face. Now, it's a little bit hard for me to disentangle myself from everything we know about Whitey Bulger now, the movies, the books, all this stuff. I mean, I had never heard of this guy. I wasn't from Boston. I knew he had some involvement in criminal activity because we needed to get guns and the way we were doing it was illegal. He was willing to do that. I didn't know who he was. Although in time, as time went out, went on, I got to know him better and I began to hear stories and, you know, things like that. But when I initially met him, I didn't know him from a crow. Like, you know what I mean? Hmm. So what was your impression of him then when you met him, when you were kind of going in without any preconceptions? Well, you know, he came across as, 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 you know, professional and intelligent and urbane. But I also rapidly deduced he wasn't a guy you could have banter with. He wasn't a guy that you could get too familiar with. I felt that he had a big ego. 
you meet, meet a lot of people like that. You know, I like I like somebody with a sense of humor and, you know, very often a self-deprecating sense of humor to an extent. If you did anything like that with, with Whitey, he'd push back, you know. He was big into this respect thing, you know, respect. I remember him telling me about the mafia and the, the north end of, of Boston, and he talked about respect. He says, when they respect me, he says, when they say respect me, I remember him telling me this. He says, what they really mean is fear me, fear me. But I remember thinking, you know, you like a little bit of fear yourself, Jim. Now, I wasn't afraid of this guy or nothing, but I was never comfortable. I was never comfortable around him. I gen- generally wasn't. It's just a sense I had. Now, there was other guys around him like Patney. And Patney has wrote a book, too, called A Criminal and an Irishman. Patney was one of Whitey's right-hand men at the time. He was from Ross Smuck in, in Galway originally. As a young child, he was a fluent Irish speaker. But actually, when I was in his house in South Boston, his parents were in the kitchen speaking fluent Irish or, or Gaelic, as they call it over there. And Pat had been a former U.S. Marine. So we, we hit it off, even though Pat was a criminal and he made no bones about being a criminal and called himself a criminal. I mean, he, I think he had a genuine interest in our struggle. I could never discern Whitey's true motivations for any of this, but I thought Pat was genuine. So uh, I know Pat did all the heavy lifting. Whitey didn't really do that much work with us. So he, he more or less gave the nod and allowed Pat to work with us. But Whitey himself didn't do too much hands-on with us, you know. He would show up maybe at midnight after I'd been working all day and I was staying in Pat's apartment and we'd be exhausted and he'd be up like he was like a vampire. He came out at night. He'd be there at three or four in the morning and I'm fighting to stay awake and not fall asleep or even yawn because, you know, that'd be very insulting to the guy. I remember that happening quite often. Hmm. And, you know, we'd be just following him in on what we were doing. Looking back at it now and some of the things I've learned about him since, you know, it, it chills me as much, as much as it chills a lot of people. Of course, he wasn't telling us that. I mean, he wasn't telling us what he was doing mm-hmm. when he wasn't with us, you know. And I wasn't telling him what I was doing when I wasn't with him. You know? <laughs> right. Makes makes perfect sense. Yeah. So can you talk about the actual process of buying all these arms? Because, you know, in the in the movies, you know, you go to a warehouse and there's just crates stacked up all over the place for purchase. But I know that it was nothing like that oh, at all for you. So I wish it was like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish, I wish life would be so easy. Oh, man. Look, at people... If somebody said to me, and I learned this very quickly, I know a guy can get you anything. I ran a mile. Because the only people who can get you anything is the FBI. Hmm. The FBI can get you anything you want, right? But, you know, with, with, with all the different licenses and all the different laws over there, somebody might be able to get something. But, you know, this notion that you can buy a surface air missile off some guy in a bar is ridiculous. You know what I mean? You see this in movies and that. Mm-hmm. No, it was a it was a laborious process. It was we the greatest thing I could get really was was fake driver's licenses, so we could just buy weapons at that time. A New York State driver's license had no photograph on it, so if we could get one and a guy roughly matched the description, that was like gold dust, you know. Hmm. So Whitey, you know, Whitey was able to provide license and things like that, and basically it was just a slog of going around to gun shops and buying buying rifles one at a time. I mean, over you know various states, there was no big arms dealer. I mentioned it in the book. At one time, I got information that there was a haul of 900 M16s. This guy had them for sale. So immediately, I was extremely suspicious and said, you know, how did you get them? He said what happened was uh, a freight train coming from the cold factory at Hartford, Connecticut, had been held up in, in north, in, in north upstate New York on an Indian reservation. Some small criminal gang had, had, ro- had robbed the freight train. They didn't know what was in it was the story. When they found those M16s, the heat from the feds was was enormous, and they were mad to get rid of them, crazy to get rid of them at, at a really cheap price. Very plausible story, very tempting story. This is where Whitey was able to help me. I went to see Whitey, and I said to him, you know, can you find out from your contacts in the police? And he had a lot of – he made it clear he had contacts at a lot of levels in, in the police, federal, state, and local. And he came back to me a day or two later, and he says, that never happened. You're being set up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you had to watch that type of thing. But to answer your question, you know, you see these movies where guys go in and buy a warehouse. And here's another thing, too, and I, and I firmly believe this. There's no such thing, really, as an illegitimate arms dealer. Anybody dealing in arms, somewhere in the background, there is some intelligence agency backing him up hmm. and allowing him to operate because he can supply people they want to supply without it coming back on them. I think anybody who's in the illegal arms trade and supplying the wrong people. I don't think they'd last a week without MI6, Mossad, or the CIA, or so, or KGB, or somebody taking them out of it. Yeah, that, that makes That's perfect sense. That's my opinion. I, 
Yeah. If it was like the movies where you go in and buy a warehouse full of guns, that, that sure would have made life easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for the most part, all the weapons that you were buying, the sellers thought that these were legitimate purchases. Oh, from a, oh of course. Right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Totally legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. So this was a months long process for you. Did you have a, like a shopping oh, list or a, a certain quantity that you needed to pick up or was it just kind of like a do your best kind of mandate? Well, it was kind of do your best thing. One of the things that really surprised me, again, when I was sent over, was not only that I was sent over because I had an American accent, but I thought, well, maybe they're sending me because I'd been in the Marines. I know I have a good knowledge on weapons and they're going to tell me what to get. They never told me anything to get. They just said, get weapons. Hmm. In fact, I remember one senior area man telling me to buy Woodmaster, Remington Woodmasters, which was a deer hunting rifle. And I remember thinking, well, you know, why would you buy a deer hunting rifle when we should be buying you know, assault rifles and things like that? I actually seen a shipment one time, a list of stuff that came from the States, and it was it was crazy. Like, it was bolt-action rifles, and it was shotguns, and it was almost every rifle was a different caliber. A lot of them only came with one magazine. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it just made no sense. I mean, it, to me, it wasn't rocket science. It didn't take a military genius to figure out that if you standardize your equipment, it, it will streamline your training and streamline your logistics. It would, mm -hmm. would have been an extremely simple thing to do, because if you're going into a gun store in America or anywhere else... It's just as easy to buy the right gun as the wrong gun. It's no harder. Like, yeah. So with your with your knowledge, then were you able to get? You know, were you trying to like standardize personally? Like you mentioned, HK ninety ones or AR fifteens. Were you trying to buy as many yeah. of the identical kind as you could? That was my goal to standardize. Yeah, to standardize as much as humanly possible to help training at home. Because you see, you could be in an IRA operation in a rural area with eight men, and every and I've seen this. Every single man has a different weapon. Every weapon is a different caliber, and some of them only have one magazine, and that magazine's not even half full. So, you know, it was just unbelievable at times. E easily resolved if you had the organization, if you had, you know, the organizational capacity, which we did. But if you had the will to resolve it, it was a very easily resolved, you know. Mm -hmm. But you'd have other people in the background saying, what are you talking about, sure? What's the problem? <laughs> you know, that's the difficulty. Okay. You know? Amazing. So after all of your work, when you finally had your shipment ready, how, how much had you been able to purchase and, and get together? Well, we we had, I think we had 172 weapons on the boat. Now, there was more. We didn't bring everything on the shipment. I mean, other people had stuff in storage and that. So it wasn't all caught. And I don't know where the storage is, by the way. So, <laughs> but so it wasn't, it, see, it wasn't a big shipment. What, what it was, was the Marita Ann, the Valhalla Marita Ann operation I was arrested on was a trial run. We had actually, we were actually working on a much larger freighter, a steel freighter. And the idea was, is, was that we would get a legitimate cargo to take back and forth to Europe and maybe once or twice a year, drop guns off the coast of Ireland. It would help finance the operation. And it also, you know, you'd have a reason for being there where you are. The operation we were on was actually a very crude operation. And the only reason we did it was because I got a I got a message from Ireland saying, "Come now, bring everything you got, and you be on the boat." Which I just could it was it was madness. I mean, I don't know why they didn't just tell me, you know, come fly home to Ireland, you know, if there's a problem, and you know we'll discuss it. But no, come now, you be on the boat and bring everything you got. So those are my orders. So be honest with you, I think we were set up. See, I don't know who gave that order. That order came through a convoluted route. So I, to this day, I don't know who gave that mm. order. I firmly believe, well, whoever gave it to us torpedoed everything we were working on. Oh. Like, I mean, I was never supposed to be on the boat in the first place. And I didn't mind being on the boat. I wasn't scared to be on the boat. But I mean, I had all the contacts. I had stuff, the entire network. You know, why? I'm not, I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a sailor. Why would I be on the boat? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the whole thing, I mean, a lot of questions to be asked there. I'll probably never get the answer to. Yeah, yeah, I got uh, you. You think it was the the unseen I, hand of the British government again? The unseen hand, absolutely. Now I don't want to, I don't want to inflate my importance. I mean, I was arrested and the world still turned. You know, I mean, but the thing about it is, I did have the contacts on the network, and and anybody in that position shouldn't be putting themselves in a position like that. You know, plus none of the stuff that we brought over was was going to make any qualitative difference there in campaign. It was standard rifles. I mean, it wasn't going to change anything at home. It wasn't strategically needed. So it's just ridiculous, the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, really. Yeah. The dark hand was in there somewhere. I'm mm -hmm. convinced of it. Yeah, I can certainly see that. So you mentioned that you were arrested. How exactly were you, you all caught on the return trip across the Atlantic? 
we came across on, on a boat called the Valhalla. We had, we gave it, gave it, we had to get it because the, 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 the freighter we were working on wasn't finished. Patney and others knew this fisherman who was willing, who had used to smuggle swordfish and he was willing for a fee, bring the stuff over to within 200 miles of Ireland. We done that. We, it's in the book too. We hit a hurricane. I'll, I'm not going to it now, but we, we had a horrendous trip over. We were, don't know how we survived. But anyway, the guns were transferred to a, a small boat called Irish fishing boat called the Marina Anne. And when the Marina Anne was heading back to County Kerry, we were arrested by the Irish Navy in Irish territorial waters. And I got 10 years in prison. Now, the, the thing about that was when the IRA was thinking an investigation as to how we were caught, the whole impetus of the investigation was something must have gone wrong in America. But the trouble with that, <clears throat> sorry, with that theory was the Irish Navy were waiting for us at a place called the Skellig Rocks off the coast of Kerry. It's a popular tourist destination for American tourists. They made one of the Star Wars movies there. Hmm. No, All I knew on the American end was I had a longitude and longitude to be 200 miles off the coast at a certain time. I didn't know the boat coming was the Marina Anne. I didn't know where the Marina Anne was going. I had no idea if it was going to Donegal, Waterford, you know, what part of Ireland. But the Irish Navy knew. You know, they were waiting for us. And I know I didn't tell them. So it was obvious to me that it came from the Irish end. Now, in time, we discovered that an informer called Sean O'Callaghan, who'd been a longtime MI5 agent, informed on the operation. He later came out and openly boasted he informed on it. But it wasn't him who told me, come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat. So there's layers There's layers. this onion mm. I'll probably never peel. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is yeah. – yeah, this story is unbelievable, the way it'll partially unravel but never completely. Yeah. Never, it never will, no. So you were sentenced, well, you, you spent 10 years in prison after that, is that correct? Yeah. So did, what, yeah. what was that like yeah, exactly? Yeah. I mean, you were you were there with a lot of other IRA guys, I take it, right? I was. Well, it was tough. Prison was tough. And, you know, there were really bad times in prison. But, you know, uh, you know, I believe in what I was doing. I was in what, we weren't like a cross-section of the population, criminals and all. I mean, these these were Irish Republicans. These were these were sound fellas. They were good good lads. There was no problems that way. I did an open. I did a university degree. I did a lot of studying. I developed myself as much as I could while I was there. I was on an escape attempt, which nearly, very nearly succeeded. So that's why. See, I, I originally got. I, I originally got ten years, but you do seven and a half years for remission. But I got an extra three and three years out to my sentence for an escape attempt in mm. November eighty five. I got out then, and then I was out for twenty months. And then I was captured in England in active service, and I was given another 35 years in prison for conspiracy to cause explosions. We were playing an operation to sabotage the city of London. It's like the Wall Street area. It's called the city of London to sabotage their electricity supply to cause financial damage to a major engine of the, of the British economy. The capital of a country that was occupying our countries, that's the way we looked at it. But I mean, we were certainly not intended to attack civilians or anything like that. It was a, it was an economic target. Right, right, right. So that I mean, it brings up a lot of points, honestly, what you just said. But one thing that I'm amazed by is I guess that even after 10 years in prison, you your resolve did not waver. Once you got out, you went right back to active operations again, I take it. Yeah, yeah. Well, many men did. People sometimes see that and they say, well, you were determined. But look, I didn't die in hunger strike. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's determination. So, you know, we had a lot of determined people. And again, you know, I, I'm critical of aspects of the organization and training. But that was down to a handful of people. Overall, they were very inspirational people. Or I couldn't have spent that time in jail and that commitment and, and, and that unless I was inspired by the people around me. And for the most part, I was, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to come across like people were stupid or incompetent or anything like that. But, you know, the reality of it is if you have civilians leading civilians, you do have problems. The trouble is we did have a pool of professional knowledge and there were people in leadership positions who should have used that pool. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about many, many other people and didn't never seem to either have the ability to do it or the willingness to do it. Hmm. Amazing. Hmm. So on that second operation that you mentioned, you were caught before initiating it. Was that a case of another informant, do you believe, that sold you out? Or were there other circumstances that led I to your arrest? So. I believe it was a former. The, the, the British intelligence services deny there was an informer, but they always do. Of course they deny. I firmly believe there was things said to me during interrogation that convinced me there was an informer. Absolutely convinced me. I can't prove it. I have my suspicions, but again, I, I can't oh, prove man. it. And oh, my gosh. I, you know, nothing That's, I can do about it now anyway. Yeah. I feel like these questions must have kept you awake every night since your release, since the Good Friday well, agreement and everything. Well, 
yeah, I think about it a lot, but it doesn't keep me awake. But the thing about it is, I th- the only thing that keeps me awake and worries me is, is not what happened in the past, is what's what happening in the future. You know, whether mm. what, what you know, whether the struggle we fought for will will, will, will you know come to fruition in, in, in a totally free and democratic republic. You know, even though it got thirty five years, the Good Friday Agreement came along. You know, the, the negotiations, and I was released after four and a half years, about four years of that sentence. So I would still be in jail. If the ceasefire had come, had come along, I went to jail in 1984, and I would still be there to this day. And I'd, I'd have only been out for 20 months in the last 39 years. My gosh. Yeah, well, I am certainly know that you're glad that you didn't spend all of that time in prison. Of course. How, how do you feel about the Good Friday agreements, though? I mean, aside from the obvious immediate benefit to you personally, like where did the agreements land in terms of Ireland's you know move toward independence? Well. I look on the Good Friday Agreement as, as a British pacification strategy. We have pacification. They say peace, but you see, in, in my opinion, you only have real peace when you when you address the root cause of a conflict. And the root cause of the conflict, from our perspective as Republicans, was Britain's claim to jurisdiction in Ireland, which hasn't been addressed. So I look on the Good Friday Agreement as a snare and a delusion because it entangles us in a web of terms and conditions regarding Irish unity that only Britain can interpret and adjudicate. Hmm. For example, they're talking about a border poll someday where well, you have a poll in the north to decide on Irish unity or not. But only a, the British Secretary of State, an English politician who doesn't have a single vote in Ireland, can decide when that poll will be called. His decision process is not made public. It's totally arbitrary and notional. If there is a poll called, he decides who qualifies the vote. He decides the wording of the poll and the what Westminster Parliament in London must decide even if the poll passes, whether they will validate it or not. So even though people say, well, you know, people voted on the Good Friday Agreement, the, the fact of the matter is, yes, they, you know, many did. But the fact of the matter is that the real political decisions are still in the hands of the British government. No Irishman or woman, elected or otherwise, can call an Irish unity poll in Ireland. That is totally in the hands of England still. Hmm. So, you know, I look at it as, a, you know, as a major scam. People say, so what? People are alive. There's no war. So what? But, you know, when you leave when you leave these threads swinging in the wind, it's never good in the long term. You know, now mm-hmm. I'm glad that I'm glad there's no war. I'm not advocating return to war. There never was a need for war ever in Ireland, ever in our history. If Britain had respected the democratic wishes of the overwhelming majority of the Irish people at any time in our history, there never would have been war in Ireland. But, you know, they didn't, and there was. So I'm glad, there's, I'm glad there is a, there's peace. And like I've said before, Justin, you know, where I support the peace, my criticism is of the process and where it's going, where it's leading. Yeah, yeah, very well said. That's, that's really interesting. I've never heard it put the way that you put it also is pacification, not peace, but that's extremely nuanced sure. look at it and very, very telling. I think that's well, a really fascinating. Sure it is. And people will say, you know, it's nuanced. And I, I know other people will say it's, it, 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 it's semantic because who cares? What you call it, <laughs> yeah. But the reality of it is, the reality of it is, there's a lot of lot of unravel threads still. Like I said, swinging in the breeze there, and this is Ireland, you know. <laughs> and in Ireland, those things tend to come back and haunt you at some stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. My gosh. So I'm I'm not sure how exactly I can ask you this or how to how you can answer it really. But are you are, sure at this stage? Are you in any way involved in in republicanism or the cause at all, like actively, or do you just sit back and observe at this point, or what? I'm not a member of any organization, but, and you see Republicanism, I don't support Sinn Féin because, because they have, they now support, because they, they've internalized the British analysis of the nature of the conflict. So I don't support them. And other Republican groups out there are very fragmented and, and disparate. They don't have their act together at all. I'm still a Republican. I speak at Republican commemorations quite often. I write articles sometimes for Republican blogs and sites. I've written the book. I will always be an Irish Republican, and if a Republican movement came up and a peaceful, I'm not, I'm not advocating anything else, but if a peaceful democratic movement would come up that would articulate the goals, as I said, of a, of a united, thirty-two county, uh, national democracy within all and a republic, and articulate it well, I, I, I would join them in the morning, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, amazing. So, what do you think? is in the future for, for Northern Ireland right now, like within your lifetime, say the next 20, 30, 40 years, what do you, where do you think this is all going? Is there a, a level of contentment with the current status quo or is there a chance of, of things flaring up again one way or the other? 
Well, there's always a, a chance of things flaring up again. I hope they don't. But you have the situation on the other side. You have loyalists who are in Northern Ireland, but are an artificial majority due to partition. At some stage, the way the demographics are going, the loyalist population in the north of Ireland will reach probably an unsustainable level. Mm. And the question then is what happens then? The, the Brits are, they play the long game, they look on long term, and they're trying to manipulate the situation so the sectarian divide is kept intact. In other words, under the Good Friday Agreement, you can still be British or you can still be Irish, even United Ireland. I mean, the whole point of our struggle was to end the connection with Britain and to build a joint civic identity as Irishmen. I mean, you look at the United States, you have African Americans, Italian, Irish, Polish, you have everything under the sun, but e pluribus unum. You have, you know, from many one, you have, you know, loyalty to one national republic. You have disparity, you have divergence, you have all these cultures, but you have loyalty to one republic. That's what I think we, we need in Ireland. Britain is in there and they are in the mix and they will try to ensure that the malignancy through which they have been able to manipulate art the sectarian malignancy will remain intact. And the Good Friday Agreement is one of the vehicles for that. But to answer your question, the future, there could be a border poll at some stage. If it's lost, loyalists may kick off. They may, I mean, they, they started the troubles. That actually, the first one in 69 was actually loyalists who began the shooting and bombing campaign. If they do, if they do so, they will do so with the help of the British intelligence services who, who have always backed them. They may try to, to repartition Ireland. They may try like a, a sort of Gibraltar. So the, to answer your question, I don't know, but there's one thing I do know and I do believe: Ireland is a very major strategic asset on the western flank of the United Kingdom, and the British if they can, are not going to leave this country and close the door behind them. They're going to try to shape the strategic environment in a, in a way that suits them and maximizes their influence here with minimum footprint, but maximum influence. So whether we're going to get the republic we envisioned, I don't know, but I know it can't happen through the Good Friday Agreement. I don't want it to happen through through war. So I'm not too sure how it's going to happen. <laughs> I wish, I, I, wish I, I, I had a crystal ball, but that's what we were fighting for at the time. And I thought that's what we would continue to fight for until we re- reached our goals, but that didn't happen. So all I can do now is write a book and <laughs> yell at the television. <laughs> well, yeah. But I'm glad. This, I just don't want anybody to get me wrong. I am glad that there's no war. I'm definitely glad of that. Yeah, certainly. I think anybody would understand and, and appreciate that sure. that perspective no matter what. So that brings us to to present day. So what are you doing now that your book is out? Do you are you working? Or are you going around? Like you said, you're doing some presentations, that sort of thing. Are you working on any other big projects at the moment? Yeah, well, I actually I was actually working on a local community project there, but I've actually retired. I turned sixty six in May, so I've, I'm actually retired on a state pension. I've been pretty busy, you know, still stuff with the book coming up. It's out nine months, but I'm still getting requests for interviews. It's being published in Italian. Oh, it's okay. going to come out in Italy soon. So a lot of stuff. I'm talking to a, there's a producer who wants to talk to me tomorrow, 9.30 tomorrow morning, Irish time. He's interested in maybe making a documentary about it. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening. Oh, fantastic. But my next project is I'm working on a novel. And it's a novel about the Troubles. It's about an active service unit in the North and the Troubles. I could be more forthcoming because I can change names and change. But okay. a lot of it's based on stuff, you know, that even if I wasn't directly involved in, I, I know about and I'm hoping maybe to have that out for next spring. So that's my next big project. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I, I had another recent guest who was directly involved in a lot of stuff that he can't describe, but he can yeah. you know, kind of lightly fictionalize it and then tell a, a very Absolutely. riveting story. I'm hoping to do the same. Great, great, great. I very much look forward to that then. Please keep me in the loop on that and I'll join up your mailing oh, list or whatever have you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, John, this has been a fantastic talk. I, I learned a lot and I really appreciate you sharing your experiences and, and you went through quite a lot there over the years, I can tell. Do you have like a social media profiles or website or anything like that if people want to try and find you and connect with you after uh, they hear this? I, I actually don't say I'm not on so, social media. I just have this old this old thing I can't get rid of about you know social media. But mm-hmm. if anybody wanted to contact me or anything like that, the publisher of the book in America is Melville House Publishing. They could be contacted and they'll pass on any messages to me. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. That's how we got in contact because you're right. You were very hard to find yeah. online. I could not get an yeah, email I'm address sorry, for you. I'm anywhere. sorry about that. I'm just not a, so I, I know people tell me I should be on social media and maybe I will be someday, but I suppose I, I'm a bit old fashioned. I don't know. 
<laughs> well, you're, you're not missing that much. I promise you are. are you, so <laughs> don't sweat it. But yeah, um, yeah your publisher yeah. put us in contact really quickly, and that worked out very well as we can all. Well, yeah. anybody who wants to get in touch with me uh, for whatever reason can go through the uh, Melville House Publishing, and I'll answer. I'll, anybody who writes to me, I'll, I'll answer them. Actually. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so yeah. much, John. This has been a great talk. And for Absolutely. anyone listening, the book is called The Yank by John Crawley. And, you know, we've covered, I would say, less than half of the content there. Honestly, he goes into so much detail about a lot of aspects of the operations that he was involved in and the larger picture with Northern Ireland and the British government and the, the very long history there. So it's a really, really enlightening read and extremely, extremely well written, easily understandable for someone like me who was not super familiar with the ins and outs of that entire conflict. So cannot recommend it enough, honestly. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Take care. Take care, Justin. Don't forget, now that you've listened to this episode, you can download a free sample of John's book to check it out for yourself. Just click the link in the show notes to read the prologue and chapter one. And if you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.